Hello, everyone, and welcome to Module 5 of Theophania's Foundations of the Craft course. I'm so happy to see you all here. My name is Gwendolyn Reese. I am the High Priestess of Theophania, which is a coven of the Assembly of the Sacred Wheel, a Wiccan tradition. So I want to go ahead and get started on what we're doing here. Today, we are going to be covering the cycles of nature, and this is our theory section. So what we're going to cover here are the patterns of the waxing and waning that are in all things. We're going to talk a bit about why it is that we work with them. We're going to talk specifically about the wheel of the year, lunar cycles, some very, very basic pieces about astrology, the magical hours, and then also talking about the human life cycle. So all of these things here are types of cycles. And I think it is important for us to note that cycles are a fundamental pattern of life, of all life. All life has these repeating patterns and cycles as part of the fundamental foundation of what it means to be alive. And this is life in any form. This can be any form of life that we have that is in the physical. It can also be for those beings who don't have physical form, they also have cycles. There are also cycles at all of the levels of creation of all of the levels of reality, which are the kinds of things that we talked about in that very, very early theoretical um, module a couple, of, a couple of times ago here. So part of these repeating patterns includes that there is always kind of a waxing, which is when things are flowing in, you can think of this as things flowing in towards manifestation, and then a waning where they're pulling back from manifestation. So there's always this kind of tidal flow of everything in and out. There's always then this other piece that is like this, which you have the, the beginning to flow in. So you have birth, growth, maturity, and then fading into death. There's always this kind of cycle. And so again, like this idea of this inrush of power, of life, of activity, reaching full manifestation, flowing out and then transforming into something else. One of the things that I want to bring up here, you will see this in astrology, but you can think about the way in which these cycles move using this, um, this language because you can then um, tap different stages of this. So the cardinal stage is, is it's at that inrush. We can think of this as like the waxing and then the fixed stage is where it is really fully manifest. It is really, really whatever this power, this life wave, whatever this is, it is at its most manifest, at full manifestation. And that is the fixed stage. And then the mutable is when it is flowing back out. And what will happen is there will be a transformation and it will flow in in a slightly different pattern. Okay, so this overarching kind of pattern of the, the waxing, the waning, you can look at it in several different directions. You can look at it in the two, flowing in, flowing out. You can look at it in the three, this kind of cardinal, fixed, mutable. And you can look at it in the four, fourfold pattern, which is the inrush, full manifestation, outrush, and that's the, the fourth here would be the, um, the equivalent of the unmanifest. So you can look at it in any of those ways, but that, that general type of flow is something that is in existence at all levels of being throughout everything. There we go. So I wanna go through some examples here. Obviously there's the breath and we use this a lot in meditation. And so for example, in fourfold breathing, you're breathing in two, three, four, hold two, three, four, breathe out two, three, four, hold on the empty two, three, four. So you can find both the natural patterns or you can manipulate these patterns 
in the breath and in manipulating these patterns. This is a large part of where you get into pranayama and so forth. But the breath is one of these cycles and it's the easiest one for us to immediately connect to in any moment. Also, you can look at these cycles through the lens of a human life. We have birth and then we have youth and then we are growing, we become adults, we become you know, at our height of power and then we begin to decline through the aging process into old age and then we die. And at least many of us believe that since cycles are always repeating, that we come back. And really you can look at this through any living thing. And by any living thing, as a pagan, I mean not only you know us and animals and plants, but also things like the lifespan of a mountain, the lifespan of a river, the lifespan of a whole planet which you know, the physical body in our understanding, the physical body of a whole planet is just the physical body. It has all of these other levels of being as well. The life cycle of a solar system, of a star, all of these different things, you'll see it in all of these. We can also then look at it in every single day. Every single day is this recurring pattern in which you have the inrush of light at dawn, it gets stronger until midday, the sun begins to decline, you have sunset, you go through the dark and you come back again. The month, and by the month in this case, we mean a lunar month. A lunar month is a natural month. The month that we have on our current human-made calendars you can divide those times up in a number of different ways, um, and but they are human calendars are not natural time. A lunar cycle is natural month. So again, you know, you have the the new moon, the dark of the moon. The moon waxes until it is full, and then it wanes, and then it is dark again, and we go through that as a cycle. The year, obviously. From, and you can start really anywhere you want on these, but let's just start the way in which, you know, we are often starting in terms of our social calendar, which is at the uh, winter solstice, where it is the longest night and shortest day. And at that point, we begin to have more daylight until it reaches the longest daylight which is at summer solstice, and then the daylight begins to decline again. There are also various cycles in astrology, and we'll go through a few of those as we come through, but some of the most grand and significant are the astrological ages, in which we are talking about the shift of an age for the entire planet. And again, if we think about the fact that a planet or solar system, any of these things have a cycle of birth, life, maturity, you know, decline, death, that is part of what we're talking about here on an astrological, when we're talking about an astrological age, it's like it's a big shift in movement in the age of the planet as a whole. So natural cycles, any of these natural cycles are objectively real. They are not social constructions. They are objectively real. And so you can use them in your magic. And this is important because as I said, human calendars, they shift, they change, they're culturally contingent. There is actually no real reason for us to have a seven day week um, other than we have decided that that is convenient and that is how we arrange ourselves. The ways in which our months are divided up, these are culturally contingent. So you can use the natural cycles because those are objectively real. And part of what that means is that if you are creating different kinds of magical um, processes like a servitor, which is an artificial intelligence that operates at the more subtle levels of reality, if you want to give a time-based 
instructions, it needs to be using one of these natural cycles because it will recognize what that means because it is objectively real. If you are working with a being, any being that is part of the natural world, any God, any ancestor, if you use contemporary human calendars, the only kinds of beings that understand contemporary human calendars are other contemporary humans. So you wanna be using natural time whenever you are working with them. And there's also a lot of power in them in terms of you know harnessing the way in which they work. So why work with the cycles? You've got your pragmatic reasons. This waxing and waning of force, of life force, of energy, this is real and it's happening regardless of what we do with it. So it is always better to go with the current. There may be circumstances in which you have to go against the current, but in general, if you can go with the current on this kind of like inrush and outflow, that is better. You can also harness those powers and qualities that are existing right then. Now, I want to, I want to, share something here when we're talking about the inrush of energy of life force and then the outflow one of the things that you might want to consider is that sometimes when you are wanting clarity on something sometimes the outflow is getting more quiet so you know we have going into life and all of its ah, like high energy sometimes when you want clarity the outflow may actually be better for you. So these are just some things to be thinking about. And as I just mentioned, the cosmos and the beings that you're working with understand your time commands. And again, uh, current human calendars are only decipherable to other current humans. So any of us who work with ancient sources in various cultures, you know, they, they calculate time differently in terms of how they do their calendars, but the cycles are always there. And I do want to point out here, there's always good, better, best. And this is something that I want you to just put in your mind and understand. That you never, ever want to sacrifice good in a theoretical drive to have better or best. So what I mean by that is we're talking about magic. We're talking about devotional practices. We're talking about various things. What is good? is to have regular practice and to actually do your magic. And so, you know, that's, that's the baseline that you should be going for. And if an attempt to get better or best gets in the way of that, if it actually keeps you from your practice, from doing magic, then it is worse. <laughs> so don't do that. Um, but the point being that, you know, when we're talking about cycles, there may be something that you want to do. And if you can link it to, I'm just going to make some stuff up. If you can link it to the moon cycle, you know, so first of all, there's the good, you're going to do this magic. Better, you've linked it to the moon cycle. Best, you've linked it to the moon cycle and you've linked it to some positive astrology in the moment. But don't wait to do the positive astrology in the lunar cycle if that is going to keep you ultimately from being able to even meet good. So as a very practical example, for the most part, Theophania's rituals are on a Sunday morning. And the reason for that is that we can all block them out on our calendar, we tend not to be working, and we will actually get together and be able to do our rituals. And that's because we all have to work in the world that makes these other kinds of calendrical demands. So for the most part, not always, but for the most part, if it is something like there is one of the big holidays, we take the Sunday that we can get that is closest to that. There may sometimes be a reason to do it on a different day if it's a particularly important ritual or if it's not gonna be a big stretch for us as far as our calendars. But what is more important is for us to actually celebrate and get together and do the magic and do the rituals than to try to be in a situation where we are meeting exactly on say the spring equinox, even though maybe it would be 
in the middle of a work day <laughs> and you would end up losing half of the people. So good, better, best, just always hold that in mind. If you can do better, great. If you can do best, even better. Never let it get in the way of the good. All right. So there's still though, there's some spiritual reasons in addition to the pragmatic reasons of why we might want to work with the cycles. First of all, in the process of consciously working with cycles, we are embedding ourselves, well, we, we are embedded. We are consciously awakening to the fact that we are a part of the natural world in a sacred way. And this is a way for us to sacralize our lives. We make our lives more sacred by integrating our interactions with the cycles intentionally. And especially if we can do this by linking the natural cycles in the context in which we are embedded with our natural human life cycle and mark these various things and make them sacred. That makes our own life more sacred. In addition to that, we ourselves in the larger being that is the group soul of humanity. And what we do has an impact on the group soul of humanity. The group soul of humanity, humanity taken as a whole, is a part of the great being that is our mother, this planet, the earth. This planet is a part of the great being that is the solar system, what we call the solar logos. So when we are consciously consciously working with the cycles, with the natural cycles, when we are bringing our intention, our awareness, and our positive activity to participating in the cycles that are part of the great life of the planet, we are helping heal the earth. We are helping sacralize again our relationship with the earth. And we are doing something that is also healing for the group soul of humanity. A huge part of the current sickness in ourselves as individuals, ourselves as the species, and ourselves as this planet, the earth, is that human life has become very separated from nature. And we are a part of nature and that does not do well for us. And it also doesn't do well for the planet. This is a sickness, it is a dis-ease. So in consciously becoming attuned and working with directly the sacred flow of the inrush, outrush and all of these different cycles, we are doing something that helps the group soul of humanity reattune to the cycles of nature and put us back in correct alignment and right relationship with the earth of which we are an important part. Not the only important part, <laughs> that's another thing. We're certainly not the only important part, but at the moment we are the part that is causing the biggest problems. So it's very important for us to get back in alignment and that will help us re-enchant the earth. So I wanna talk quickly here about the wheel of the year. And this is the Wiccan wheel of the year. This is the way in which Wiccans specifically consciously move through the cycles and participate in the cycle. So these are our big festivals. These are the Sabbaths and there are eight of them. And in working with the wheel of the year throughout the year, again, we are, we are um, re-enchanting the earth. We are sacralizing our individual lives and we are helping humanity play its appropriate role because we are part of the mind of the planet in particular, play its appropriate role in making sacred sense and of these um, cycles as we move through the seasons. So the eight of them, we have the solstices and the equinoxes. The solstices, that would be the winter solstice is, as I said, the longest night and the shortest day. The summer solstice is the longest day and the shortest night. The equinoxes on either side are when the day and night are at exactly equal 
percentages. So those four are very important. And then there are the cross quarter days. And there's astrology behind this also, but the cross quarter days are roughly halfway between each of those. So the thing that I think is um, useful as we are paying attention to the seasons is that at the solstices and the equinoxes, this is kind of what's going on seasonally in the heavens. The cross quarter days, which would be in bulk February 2nd, Beltane May 1st, Lunasa August 1st, and Samhain October 31st. Those are where those seasons become most potently manifested on the earth. So as an example, you know, we have summer solstice is in June. And a lot of times are actually the one that's even more potent than that, that we can really tell, at least in this area, I'm in the Eastern coast of the United States. So Ostara, which is the spring equinox, that's the beginning of spring. It is not uncommon to get a snowfall after the beginning of spring. So it certainly often does not feel like spring yet, but when you get to May 1st, spring is here. So Ostara is spring at the level of the heavens and Beltane is like, we are now in spring right where we are. That is the height of spring. All right. So some of the ways to work with the seasons, first of all, just be aware and celebrate and consciously participate. And I put down here, memento mori, remember that you will die. <laughs> because one of the things that I think is really important as we are talking about how to sacralize our lives is that there are things that happen that only ever happen in a season and that makes them special. You know, one of the things that's a little dangerous is when we suddenly have the ability through our consumer culture to get things that used to be special at a particular point in time that are part of what made something special and like, well, now we can have it all the time. What actually ends up happening is it becomes not special. So I think that there is a lot of value to having certain things that are special and paying attention to them and looking for them and actually, you know, having that moment in which you pause and you really experience with gratitude and wonder the change of the world. So like, and paying a lot of attention to the natural world, paying attention to when do the buds and the trees come out? When do the crocuses come up? You know, um, so I'm about to enter spring here, yay. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's always, there's a lot of joy that starts to come with that, right? Um, but also things like, you know, I love cherries. I love cherries. And so for me, both the first and the last cherry of the season are important moments and I look forward to them. And I take that moment to really be grateful and participate. So finding those things in which there is a seasonal component and pausing and making them memorable and actually being aware and celebrating are really important things. The other thing that is really important and useful is that you can use the agricultural year as an intentional metaphor for spiritual growth. And this is something that I initially learned through paganism, uh, uh, contemporary paganism, but I will tell you is also there in terms of the metaphors that are used in say ancient Greece in which we talk about spiritual development through the metaphor of tending an orchard or um, you know, tending a garden. So when you are working on your own spiritual growth and also the way in which you interact with your own growth through the year, you can use the agricultural year as a metaphor so that you know, in the dark times, when you are um, at the winter, you are planning. That is the right time to plan. And then early on in the winter, you are preparing the ground. You are beginning to prepare the ground and lay the foundations for whatever growth it is that you are about to undertake for the year. And then you kind of plant the seeds. So you are beginning to do that work. And then you are beginning to tend the seeds. 
as they grow. You are removing obstacles, which would be weeding, right? Um, you are feeding the nourishment that something needs in order to grow. You are checking and rechecking yourself on how is this developing. And then there is the harvest, which is where, you know, you are really kind of at the point of taking in the fruits of whatever it is of your growth of whatever it is that you have been doing. And you take note of whether or not what you were doing was working. And then by the end of the harvest, um, which is, you know, at, at Samhain is the final harvest, um, Halloween. And then what you are doing at that point is, so there's celebration also of your growth. You always have to celebrate your own growth. We often don't actually celebrate enough. And then you are beginning to take the lessons and go back into the reflective time and spending the time to reflect on your growth, what happened, what didn't happen, what worked, what didn't work as you then reflect on what your new goals for growth will be. So that is using the agricultural year as a metaphor for spiritual growth, but also as an organizing principle that really is powerful if you use it. And also kind of keeping in mind as you're going through your time and looking at your own growth, are there things I need to weed? Is there pruning that needs to be done? Um, you know, is there like, am I, am I not nurturing something? Have I not given some area of growth what it really needs as far as like, you know, the, um, the equivalent of fertilizer and sunshine and things of that nature. So this is something that I actually have on my dresser and I encourage you to take a look and maybe consider getting or building something like this. So you can see here that I wanted to point out, I'm just gonna go through the wheel of the year really quickly, but you can see on the outside, I've got the wheel of the year, one rung in from that, I have the astrological symbols and then there's the lunar. And I just move those crystals around to kind of keep myself in tune with what's going on and to consciously engage. So as I said, Yule is what we call winter solstice. In bulk, February 2nd, that is, it's also sometimes called candle moss or breeds moss. Ostara is spring equinox, sometimes called albanilar. Beltane, which that is May 1st, May Day, May Eve. We have Letha, which is the summer solstice. Lunasa, sometimes also called Lamas, which is August 1st. Mabin, which is the fall equinox. Samhain, also sometimes called Halloween, obviously, October 31st, and then we're back at Yule. So that is the, the wheel of the year with the eight festivals that we celebrate. So I also want to go through a little bit of common Wiccan mythology. Not everybody um, uses these paradigms, but it's there for the seasons. So there's the goddess and the harvest lord. And so in this kind of mythology, if you will, we think about the feminine and the masculine principles moving through the seasons and the goddess as the earth and the harvest lord is the um it, it's understood as the vegetal vegetable life or the vegetal life that's the word i'm looking for <laughs> so you know the the earth is fairly constant um although there's a certain amount of growing and then you have like the the plant life okay so in that one in that mythology just going back here you have um at yule you begin to have uh, some of the, the, wane, the waxing of the light. Oh, and sometimes also the vegetal life is also sometimes the sun lord. So we go through a number of different ways. So we have the birth of the light again. Um, and then by Ostara, we really have the birth. We're beginning to have the birth of the vegetable kingdom again. So you're having the trees are beginning to, have, you know, they're having buds and things are beginning to arise out of the ground. By Beltane, this is where you have um, the idea of like the plants are now really kind of thriving and it's the 
Harvest Lord is now a young man. And then you have, you know, the goddess is seen at that point in terms of the earth as like a bride. So this is obviously, there's some sexual metaphors in here, but we have, again, this idea of the young, beautiful um, green Lord, right? And so, and then by the time we're getting into Lunasa, that is our first harvest. So we're beginning to see the death of the Lord, um, Mabin, second harvest. And then by Samhain, we have the final harvest. Um, and traditionally in certain cultures, uh, by the time anything that is not harvested by Samhain is supposed to be left unharvested um, for the Fae. Okay. And then we go into the dark time, which is the morning time, and then you know, again, the rebirth. So that's one of the um, Wiccan kind of modes of thinking about this as you're thinking about the earth goddess and then like basically the, the Lord that is the masculine principle that is the, the growing things. Another is the Oak King and the Holly King. And again, in this one, you have the goddess as the earth who is kind of moving through her cycles. And then you have the Oak King and the Holly King. So in, and they, um, they have battles for rulership, basically. So at Yule, you will have the Oak King will be in battle with the Holly King and the Oak King will triumph. And from Yule until summer solstice, this is the time in which the Oak King rules with the goddess. And then in the summer solstice, they battle again and the Holly King kills the Oak King and the Holly King then is ruling with the goddess <clears throat> until Yule when they fight again. So that's another thing that you will sometimes see in terms of these, these two kings, the Oak and the Holly. Another is just tracking through the year in our understanding of uh, the deities in these kind of big archetypal ways. So not necessarily a specific deity, but these archetypal deities um, that you will sometimes see with Maid Mother Crone, Youth Father Sage. So again, with the, the spring, this is like coming into that inrush. This is the time in the maid, the time of the youth. And then we get into like more towards that full manifestation of light. And that would be the time of the mother, the time of the father. And then as the, the year um, in terms of like really the, the sun begins to wane, we go into the crone and the sage. And there is something I think particularly potent about this because it does show you in terms of like working with it a little bit more when there's the time for really kind of that inrush headed towards manifestation. And when there's more of a time that you should be moving more internal in terms of reflection. So those are some of the ways in which we work with the big wheel of the year. Now we also work with the lunar cycles, the S-bots is what we call those. And there are a number of these. There's the dark of the moon, which is the, the new moon where it is really, it, it is dark. And then there's the waxing moon as it is increasing, the full moon and the waning moon. Now for the dark and the full, what you really wanna do if you're using it is you wanna do just like a little bit before the actual transition, because the second it moves into, um, you know, the second it moves past the immediate full moon, you are into waning. And most of the time of what you're wanting is to use full moon magic. You wanna get it like right when it's almost there rather than have it on the other side. And the same thing in the other direction with the dark of the moon. So again, waxing increases and waning is for decreasing or removing. But you can frame your magic in almost, you can use any, almost any moon cycle to frame your magic. It's just, you're gonna do it differently. And as I had mentioned, sometimes the waning is if you wanna do like remove the distractions so that I see more clearly, <laughs> that actually can be quite powerful. But just thinking about it, you know, um, if what you were trying to do is build towards a new job, let's say, 
something kind of mundane, but let, let's take it. So you might on the waxing moon be putting forward your energy towards that in terms of increasing your visibility, increasing your opportunity, increasing your um, your charisma. And then on the other side, if you were doing it on the waning, you might be looking to remove obstacles um, you might be looking to remove any, you know, habits that you want to give up that maybe you're in your way, any of these kinds of things. So you can frame things in different ways there. Now in the Hellenic cycle, um, the dark of the moon is sacred to Akate, the goddess Akate, goddess of crossroads, thresholds, all these different things. That's, that's her festival. And then Numenion, which is the first day after the dark of the moon. So it is at the absolute beginning of the, um, of the increase is also, that is, a, that is a sacred blessing day, Numenion. On the, uh, and it's sacred to all of the beings. Numenion is generally sacred. The third day of the waxing moon, and I'm mentioning these specifically because Theophania works with Athena and Apollon primarily. The third day is sacred to Athena and the seventh day is sacred to Apollon because three is the sacred number of Athena and seven is the sacred number of Apollon, which actually is where we get lucky seven. That's, that's because he was considered of the various gods to be absolutely benefic. And so lucky seven has to do with him and the seventh day of the moon is sacred to him. Um, interestingly, they did not do a whole lot further than, um, you know, the first kind of, I think eight or eight or nine days, then you don't have, you know, you don't have like the full moon and you don't do a whole lot with the waning moon. So theirs are all front loaded into the waxing with the exception of Agate in that dark of the moon time which is also when, you know, when you make your sacrifice to a kate, that is always also a sacrifice to the poor. So again, though, part of the challenge with the lunar cycles is that they are not tied to our current calendar. And so again, when you are working on doing your uh, ritual planning, when you're working on using a spell, good, better, best, you can think through how to reframe or shape your magic based on whatever lunar day it is you know no matter what that that stage of the moon is you can find a way to frame your magic in that way so that realistically if you are like i can do this on a thursday <laughs> then you look at the thursday and you see what's what um phase the moon is in and you use that to frame your magic but if you can make the best possible choice, if you know it would be better for me to do something on say the seventh day of the moon, wax, uh, waxing moon because it's sacred to Apollon and you know, a number of other things, then, then great, you know, do that. And of course the other piece of this, uh, again, with good, better, best that I just keep coming back to, like if you need to do a healing ritual, like right then, you do it right then. You just do it. You know, never let perfection become the enemy of the good. Okay. Astrology. So astrology, and I, I should put this in here. I am um, studying more about astrology. I am not an astrologer. And this is a very complex, deep, rich science. So I'm going to give you what I understand, but I also want you to be clear that there are people who spend an entire lifetime working on this and I am not one of them. I think I have more knowledge than like the average person, but there are people that, you know, far, far, they're, they're the equivalent of the Stephen Hawking's out there in astrology and I am not any place close to one of them. So astrology as we understand it, like Western astrology, and for that matter, some of the history of Vedic astrology, because it's rooted, if you go back ancient enough, it's rooted in the same sources. Um, you know, you have the Babylonian and the Egyptian, both have some, uh, you know, have very ancient, all of these kind of um, 
observations. And then you have the Greeks who learn from the Babylonians and the Egyptians and have some of their own stuff. And then you have the founding of like Hellenistic astrology, which gets taken over into India. And then the Indians take that and do their thing with it. So it comes from a, a same root, but then at that point, there's a, a differentiation in the paths of development, but there is a lot of similarity, but there, there's some difference, but a lot of similarity just in terms of, you know, what people are, are watching and the correlations of the recording and so forth. But what astrology is really about is that it is a mode of study, because that's what this word means, um, of the stars, but it's specifically a study of the way in which fate works. That's really what it's trying to get at, right? And astrology is operative at the level of the solar logos. So before when I said, and I've said this several times at this point, human beings are cells in a bigger being. And that bigger being is humanity itself. Humanity is a part of a greater being. And that greater being is the planet itself. The planet is a part of a greater being. And that greater being is the solar system, which would be the solar logos. So the solar system, the solar logos is a great cosmic being in which what we perceive as the, the physical solar system is just the body of this being. It has all the other levels. It's got the emotions, it's got the mental, it's got the spiritual, it's got all the other levels also in a much, much bigger cosmic way than we do. So in the solar logos, like I said, there are smaller beings that make up the larger being that is the entire solar system. And those smaller beings that make up the big solar system are the planets. <laughs> So the planets, the planets themselves are real beings. The planet that we see when we see Saturn is just the body of Saturn. Saturn also has emotion, mind, all of the astral stuff that we think about, all of that spirit, soul, all of that, that being that is Saturn has. And it is much like trying to comprehend the being that is this planet of which we are a part. It is like that level of big, big cosmic being, right? And then, like I said, the whole thing makes up the uh, being that is the solar system. So astrology then is really, it's focused. Um, oh, I should say one more thing. So the planets are real beings in the ancient world. They only knew some of them. They knew the ones that were visible at that point. And then we have discovered more of them later. The, so um, most ancient astrology only deals with the sun, the moon, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. Sorry, I forgot Mars in there. <laughs> so it deals with the big seven. And then since then we have learned more and there's also asteroids but any of these they're they're real beings they can be invoked they can be communed with um you know they they but they're very big <laughs> so anyway astrology is focused on the earth and so i want to be clear that this we use the names of certain constellations for the signs but the signs are actually not about the constellations at all. What it is is that we have divided everything up from an uh, Earth-centric perspective because we are on Earth and we are trying to understand the nature of fate from the perspective of this planet. And we've divided them up into 12. And that's that's actually how that works. The 12 equal sections of this. So the, the use names are coming from constellations that, you know, were being applied back in the very ancient days, but that's not actually a part of the way in which astrology works and never was. So I think that's important to know. But again, this is like a huge field of endeavor. This is an entire sacred science. And there are people that are, you know, hardcore PhDs with that, that have taken decades to learn it. 
But on this very macro level, which I mentioned before, there are astrological ages. And this really has to do with like the life wave and the life pattern of the life of the whole planet. So not any individual, but the life of the whole planet. But then there's a lot that has to do with our particular cycles. So I am also going to mention, though, a few of the ones that um, on a more micro level, you may be wanting to pay attention to when you're doing your work. First of all, Mercury retrograde. Um, Mercury retrograde, I think a lot of people, you know, probably know this. There are uh, good and bad things about that. Part of the challenge there is that you don't want to, if you can avoid it, if you can avoid it, you don't want to start things during a Mercury retrograde. It's a really good time, and it happens about three times a year, to finish up or follow up on things that are already started, to do some reflection and some planning maybe. <coughs> Excuse me. But if you can avoid starting things in a Mercury retrograde, do. On the other hand, I have negotiated contracts during a, a Mercury retrograde because I had to. You don't always have an option. And when that is the case, then you try to do some other things to try to balance that out a little bit. But in general, in Mercury retrograde, things tend to go a little funky with like communication, technology, travel, a lot of the kinds of stuff that sort of... Um, uh, what do you call it, like graces the wheel of human existence and interchange. That's the stuff that tends to go a little bit sideways. And um, so there's a, a greater chance of misunderstandings and so forth. So if you have an option, taking a look at a Mercury retrograde and trying not to start things or not do things that require a lot of communic smooth communication, smooth telecom, honestly, you know, the communication that goes through electricity is also very, very heavily impacted, I have found, um, you know, that that's better. All right. The moon sign, the, the moon moves through the different signs of the zodiac pretty quickly. And so a lot of times, if you want to pull in energy from a particular um, a particular sign, it's often you have the flexibility to wait until the moon hits that sign. And that's usually a lot faster than waiting for, you know, say a particular season or a month to do something. So they go through pretty much all of the, um, you know, go through the, all the signs over the course of a lunar month. So uh, moon void, of course. So kind of here's a metaphor for you. And again, like I'm not an astrologer, but this is my understanding. The moon is also related to the astral plane. So that, that subtle plane that is right above the physical. And therefore, when we are pulling in various energies, they are kind of being... Um, transmitted to us through the moon is one way of thinking about it you know so they're kind of getting colored by whatever that um the moon sign is so when the moon moves into a sign it goes through and makes a number of aspects these kinds of relationships where you know there's there's different kinds of um patterns or messages from the different planets so it, it makes these aspects with the other planets when it gets to the end of all the aspects it's gonna make within the period of that sign, then there's like a little gap. And that gap can be very, very brief, like, you know, a couple of minutes. On occasion, it, it's a little bit more substantial before it moves into the next sign. And during that time when there's a gap where it's not making aspects to anything, it's really just kind of more or less itself at that moment then that is when the moon is void, of course. This can be used and it also can be um, troublesome. So my understanding is that because it's got this very strong, like I said, astral thing, that when the moon is void, of course, so it's not making um, aspects to any of the other planets, then it's kind of like 
um, more difficult for things to get through that lunar energy, that astral energy into manifestation. So it's not a great time to do work that requires manifestation. Now, sometimes it can be used, like if there is something that you just cannot avoid um, and you know you have to do it and it is gonna cause something in manifestation, but you really wish that it didn't. And so you wanna minimize the impact of that. That's a good time to use a moon void, of course. So, you know, some unpleasant bit of business or of news that you really have to do, but you don't want its effect lingering, good time to use void, of course. Um, but it also means that if what you're doing is really primarily at the level of the astral and you don't need or want it to be like in the world of manifestation, so like you're doing divinatory work, you're doing kind of journey work, you're doing things that are on the astral and you would prefer not to have as much interference from the manifest world because a lot of times those of us who are doing work where what we're really trying to do is maintain our level of consciousness above the physical and not get interference from the physical, then actually moon void, of course, may be a completely perfect time to do that because you're not gonna have as much interference in that way. So those are just some of the ones like on a more micro level that are probably worth you know, knowing a little bit more about. Now it's actually worth knowing all of this, but you know, um, like I said, there's, a, there's just like way more than I am competent to do or have time to do in this. Okay. Now, I also want to talk a little bit about the cycles of the day because this is readily accessible to any of us. You can totally work with the different cycles within the day. So, you know, you can do things at dawn, morning, midday, afternoon, twilight, night. You can harness the power of any of those. And I particularly want to call out here the powers of dawn, by which I mean starting at about 30 minutes before the sun rises up until when the sun rises and you really begin to get the, the full sun in the sky. And then um, dusk or twilight, which is about 30 minutes or so, like when the sun is setting and about 30 minutes or so afterwards, where it's still giving you the um, some of the light, but the sun has gone down. Those two places are really big liminal moments that are available to you at any day. Liminality, if I have not gone through this before, but I think that I have, that is when things are neither betwixt nor between. They're very, very potent times for magic. So that moment on the front side of the dawn and then on the twilight side are incredibly potent moments for magic and they are available. Um, there's also the planetary hours. This is another way, you know, if you don't even want to wait for like when the moon is in a particular sign, you're like, I need planetary energy right now for this. Okay, so it is available to you every day. The planetary hours just include the seven classical planets. So each of the signs, each of the astrological signs has, um, you know, there's a planet that is kind of like uh, in its happy place when it is in that sign. So as a ruler of that sign. And so there is an ancient system in which, uh, you know, you take from sunrise to sunset, and that is a natural daytime. And then sunset to sunrise is natural nighttime. You know, there's there's nothing about this entire, like the day closes, changes over at midnight. That is a complete social construct, it's not natural. So you take the sunrise to sunset and you divide those equally by 12. And then sunset to sunrise, you divide those equally by 12 and then depending on a whole bunch of different things, and you can get charts for this, each one of those hours is assigned a, um, a planetary ruler. Okay, so, and it has to do with the signs, um, the astrological signs. So obviously the issue here is when the planetary hour is, like when, if I wanted the planetary hour of Jupiter or something, that is going to depend upon where am I and what time of year is it? Because they're moving every day. The length of sunrise to sunset is different. So this is one of those places where, you know, if you really wanted to be very complex, they have amazing timekeeping in the ancient world that has to do with this kind of stuff. 
but you can use an app and that's what I would recommend. But anyway, that is also a way to make that available to you. So now I wanna talk a little bit about human life cycles. So we have traditional rites of passage, some of which are, are still relevant, a lot of which we don't do and we'd probably be better off if we did. But some of the traditional rites of passage would be things in which we, we take this moment and we make these transitions sacred. Obviously birth, birth is a huge one. Um, there are often ones that are associated in various cultures with things like, um, you know, the first tooth or the first step, or there's a number of different things like that. But these places in which we mark like sacred growth experiences. And some of the ones that are, you know, we talk about a lot in various kinds of academic circles and so forth have to do with the fact that we in our culture do a terrible job of rites of passage from childhood to adulthood. And that is a very important one. And where that is keeps moving on us. So, you know, physically for let's say girls, it's the most obvious. Physically, it's with menarche. And at that point you are physically an adult. Socially, you're not even close to an adult. We have so complicated our social structures that a lot of people are going well into their twenties and not really feeling like adults. So, you know, this is an area in which there's this kind of um, challenge right now about how do we sacredly mark a difference between someone moving from childhood into adulthood. And at the moment, the biggest thing that we have is that you can go get drunk with your friends legally. And that's not a healthy one. <laughs> so this is something for us to think about. And then of course, you know, for a lot of cultures, marriage was a really big rite of passage. Again, that was sometimes used as kind of like, now you're a full adult and in this full adult role as a householder or whatever, but that's also not necessarily appropriate in our current culture. And then, you know, there's um, for, then there's of course the death rites. So I would say at the moment, we actually really could use some work collectively on finding and developing new or additional ones that match our social reality and are meaningful because human beings need these markers to make sacred meaning of their lives and we struggle without it. So there are within paganism, we have things where we begin to acknowledge like the croning rituals as you are becoming an elder, like the various kind of elder rituals and so forth like that. I personally would love to see one created for parents whose children have become adults because there's also a big transition away from, you know, there's the transition of like the child now into you are now an adult and you need to be able to act as an adult. And part of that means that the parents need to allow them to act as an adult. And this is a very complex thing, I think, in our culture. So I, I wish that we would work more on these, but there's also a few that are kind of natural. And I'm just gonna encourage you to go look these up because you can get a much better sense of them than I will be able to give you in just a few seconds. So some of the astrological markers of things that are um, times in which you will be having some of these experiences and the meaning that you make of them and what you do with them are up to you. But some of the really big ones is that typically most people have two Saturn returns. So there's one usually around 28 and then there's another one in your 50s. Um, the Uranus opposition is another, which is when Uranus is uh, directly opposite of where it was when you were born, and then your Chiron return. And so, you know, there's two Saturn returns, the Uranus opposition, Chiron return, often the first Jupiter return also, but I'm just going to encourage you to go look up some of those and then be mindful. But the big thing that I just want to point out here is that it is important to us to mark the time in your life, however it is meaningful to you and to put some moments aside and to be like, this is a sacred transition and to make it sacred for yourself. Part of what we're doing in Reenchanting the Earth, I believe is trying to create more structure around some of these moments. Um, but this is something that is incredibly important. And I actually try to do this at least once a year around my birthday is to take a moment and reflect on the fact that I'm going through a solar return and uh, you know what this what this means 
and how I want to move forward and so forth. So thank you so much. And in the next section, we're going to talk a little bit more about specifically, pragmatically, how to do work with the cycles. Thank you.